In, um, after some 20 years uh, of intensive cardiographic research, the picture that uh, we have now is uh, uh, the following. So if you think of uh, uh, a traditional structural representation uh, of closal structure, like the one um, indicated in point one in the handout, with a few X-bar layers organized hierarchically, um, by using cardiographic lenses, um, um, the, uh, this, this structure looks like an abbreviation of a much more detailed representation. For instance, um, uh, the complementizer system looks like somebody, some, some representation like uh, two, uh, characterized by a sequence of functional elements organized hierarchically. And the same is true of uh, all the major zones uh, of the close and of the major uh, phrases. So the, the, the cartographic program has shown, I think, a significant heuristic capacity in the sense that it has promoted and organized research on many languages and discovered properties, important properties of syntactic configurations. Uh, first, uh, properties concerning the order of projections in functional sequences, then other distributional properties, uh, and properties of freezing that I will discuss uh, later today. Here on point three of the handout, uh, uh, I have uh, put a rather arbitrary list of publications just to give an idea uh, of uh, the uh, cross-linguistic coverage of uh, cartographic uh, research, which extends to many language families and groups, and which is present in uh, Latin America, and particularly in Brazil, and here in uh, Florianopolis, uh, starting from uh, Carlos Mioto's uh, seminal uh, contribution on the left periphery of Brazilian Portuguese, and other important contributions by Mary Cato, Cristina Figueiredo and their students that uh, Sandra referred to in uh, her uh, presentation. Um, so the, 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 the topic of this talk really concerns the connection between functional sequences and explanation. Um, there, there are two types of relations, uh, in fact. So uh, by borrowing a certain uh, terminology um, from the philosophy of science, we could say that functional sequences could be taken as explanants. So it's something that contributes to the explanation of other uh, phenomena. Um, this concerns, for instance, the use of functional sequences that is uh, uh, made in nanosyntax in connection with certain phenomena like syncretism, <coughs> for instance. Certain generalizations of syncretism, for instance, in Saha's dissertation, are uh, addressed and explained uh, in, by, by a series of uh, ingredients, including properties of functional sequences within the nominal uh, system. I'll be more interested here in the second type of relation. That is to say, we can and should take uh, functional sequences as explananda. That is to say, as uh, uh, properties, complex properties, that in and of themselves require an explanation. So the uh, project here is to try to relate uh, and deductively relate, in fact, the complexity that we observe in cartographic representations to uh, simple principles that are plausible principles of universal grammar, right? It's extremely unlikely that the complexity of cartographic representations would uh, form a primitive uh, uh, somehow engraved in universal grammar. The more likely, most likely possibility is that this complexity can somehow be explained in terms of the interaction of uh, more plausible and much simpler uh, principles of linguistic computations. So if we phrase things in uh, this way, there are two main areas which we can uh, look at for I, for, for, for making this, these further steps in uh, uh, the explanatory process. Um, 
uh, and we are at point six uh, of the handout now, uh, we could look at interface principles. Uh, on both interfaces, uh, logical form and uh, uh, phonetic form. So it could be, and it clearly is in certain cases, that interface systems have requirements uh, that put demands uh, on linguistic representations, on syntactic representations, thus enforcing certain properties. So that's a natural area where to look for further explanation uh, on, on both interfaces, as I said. So, for instance, uh, uh, principles uh, uh, of selection, principles of interpretation of, cartograph of uh, um, particularly criterial configurations uh, and uh, uh, other uh, similar properties, including properties at the PF interface, which I will briefly uh, discuss later, may have this role. And, of course, we should look within the syntactic box. Uh, formal syntax is organized in terms of certain formal principles, which may, of course, have a say and may have an explanatory value with respect to certain properties observed in uh, the sequences. So if one uh, uh, phrases things in uh, this way, cartographic research, apart from the descriptive contributions that uh, can come from the project, uh, can function, um, can nourish somehow uh, theoretical reflection uh, by generating interesting empirical problems for further theoretical reflection. And this sense uh, can enlarge, I think, the empirical basis of uh, linguistic theorization, syntactic theory in particular, and the study of the interfaces. Okay, so as uh, I will uh, be uh, talking specifically about the left periphery, let me say something about the criterial uh, system, which is uh, critical, uh, which has an important role in uh, the cartographic analysis uh, uh, of the left periphery. So the, according to this uh, uh, approach, uh, the left periphery is populated by a sequence of uh, functional heads uh, like topic, focus, uh, uh, cue for questions, and so on and so forth, which have a dual uh, role, as indicated in point seven. On the one hand, these heads trigger movement, uh, trigger movement of phrases to specifier positions. Um, and on the other hand, they have an interface role. That is to say, they guide interpretive procedures on both interfaces, determine the interpretation uh, at the logical form and determine properties at the interface with semantics and pragmatics, uh, and also determine and guide uh, processes of assignment of uh, contour, of intonational contour, for the assignment of the often special properties, intonational properties, that the relevant constructions uh, have. So, under this kind of approach, um, the uh, uh, structure of certain A-bar uh, constructions in English, for instance, has simplified representations like uh, eight, uh, in which there is this system of criterial heads, indicated here as Q, topic, focus, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, for similar constructions, uh, which have this dual function, attraction in syntax, uh, and triggering of interpretive properties uh, at the interfaces. Um, th this kind of approach is made uh, immediately uh, plausible by the existence of languages, uh, uh, relevant examples are indicated in nine, in which these criterial heads are in fact pronounced, are explicit morphemes uh, uh, overtly expressed in structures. So in 9a we have for instance, uh, an indirect question in certain Dutch varieties uh, in which what plausibly is to be analyzed as a Q head uh, which appears adjacent uh, to the WH element. Uh, and then in many languages, uh, uh, the illustration is provided by the African uh, language, by the Kwa language uh, Gungbe in 9b, c, and d. Many languages we have overt markers of uh, uh, topic, uh, of focus, uh, and also with the possibility of co-occurrence of these elements 
as in uh, 9D, uh, for instance. So by making uh, natural and uh, uh, necessary uniformity assumptions, which are really a basic ingredient of comparative syntax, uh, we may start from the assumption that all languages work like that. That is to say that all languages uh, manifest uh, this system of criterion heads, uh, except that in some languages they are overtly realized and in other languages they are uh, null as a uh, uh, kind of natural uh, and low-level parameterization distinguishing the two types of languages. At this point, uh, an analytical question arises, that is to say, can we um, argue in favor of the idea that these markers are in fact part of the closal structure, part of the closal spine, or shouldn't they be analyzed rather as uh, case-like elements attached to the phrases that uh, we find in the left periphery. I have discussed this issue in some detail in the mini-course that immediately preceded this conference. I will not go through the evidence again, but we can go back to this question, which is fairly important, uh, maybe in the discussion uh, period. Let me uh, focus on um, uh, the interpretive properties, the interface properties uh, of criteria structures. So we have configurations like um, on page 4, 27, 28, 27. Um, so the uh, interpretive routine that uh, is triggered by the topic head uh, basically says, well, interpret my specifier as a topic, whatever exact properties you want to attribute to this notion. I will go back to this uh, point later and interpret my complement as the comment associated to that topic. And similarly, for focus heads, as in uh, left peripheral focus heads, as in 28, uh, the instruction is interpret my specifier as uh, focus of the specific kind. As we'll see, there are several, type, several types of foci uh, expressed in uh, the left periphery. Uh, I'll be talking in particular of corrective uh, focus, but so focus with some specification and interpret my complement as the presupposition, as the element that I share uh, with my interlocutor in the relevant discourse situation. Um, now, the um, felicity and appropriateness conditions uh, for the use of these configurations can be elucidated by uh, using simple um, fragments of uh, uh, of, of discourse, uh, for instance, simple uh, dialogues, sequences of sentences, as those indicated in 29. So, for instance, in 29a, here I'm using Italian, um, a speaker introduces a certain referent, for instance, the Maldive Islands, and then another speaker, 29b, uh, may take up this referent, uh, introduce it as a topic, uh, and make a comment uh, uh, about it. Uh, 29b, beh, alle Maldive, something that was introduced before, ci sono andati in viaggio di nozze, they went on uh, honeymoon. Um, one can study precisely, experimentally, the um, intonation, characteristic intonation of these configurations. For instance, in a work by Giuliano Bocci, experimental work, the intonation attributed uh, to the sentence in Italian, or rather, I should say, Sienese Italian, so it's the Italian that Sandra was exposed to and uh, Carlon was exposed to, so they will recognize immediately the contour, uh, 30, 30, right? So in, uh, notice in this contour the fact that uh, the topic has uh, a certain high level of prominence and the comment has a hilly structure, has a structure with prominences uh, of uh, various kinds, uh, which separates it very neatly from the other contour assigning, assigned to focus and presupposition. This comes from Giuliano Bocci's uh, work. Now, let's look at the focus uh, uh, case. Now, in uh, Italian, not all foci can use the left periphery. There is some amount of uh, parametric variation on this point. Um, 
One clear example of a focus that uh, uses the left periphery is corrective focus. So somebody makes a statement, I correct the statement, as in 31AB, 31A, somebody says, um, well, uh, if I understood correctly, they went to the Virgin Islands, I can correct this statement, as in 31B. It is by alle Maldive, so I'm that in Viaggio di Notte, I'm exaggerating the contour a little bit, uh, but uh, you can see in 32 how it goes. There is a very high peak, on, uh, a very high prominence on the corrective focus, and then a complete flattening of what uh, uh, follows. And Giuliano Bocci has elaborated a system of contour assignment rules that uh, uh, use um, um, cartographic representations for, uh, to, to, to calculate the, con the contour of these structures. As I said, not all foci uh, can uh, be expressed in the left periphery in Italian. For instance, uh, the, the, the simple case of new information focus cannot, must be used uh, in the lower uh, part of the structure, as uh, the inability uh, observed uh, years ago. But there is, a, again, a parametric variation here in that even very close, uh, even varieties that are very close to standard Italian, like Sicilian and Sardinian variety, use the left periphery also for new information uh, focus. So they can uh, answer, it's possible to answer in these systems uh, a, a WH question by putting the uh, focalized element, the, the element that corresponds to the variable, uh, in initial position, as uh, in uh, structures like 35, 35A prime is not a possible answer to a WH question in Southern Italian, but it is, for instance, in uh, uh, Sicilian. Now, once we have uh, identified these uh, basic ingredients, these basic properties, we can start looking at uh, generalizations. So one generalization that I discussed at length uh, uh, in the mini course, and which I uh, will quickly go through uh, here, uh, is that there are certain systematic differences uh, between uh, topics and uh, foci uh, across languages. One systematic difference is that uh, it is quite possible and quite frequent, in fact, to find languages uh, that uh, uh, permit a multiplicity of topics. For example, the Romance languages, where you find examples like 43, you can have here three topics, you could have four, you could have five, I mean, there can be as many topics as there are topicalizable elements. 44 is a corresponding example of a language with multiple topics, but in which topic markers are overtly expressed. This is a BG, so this little particle a K, as in 44, uh, is a topic marker, and it can occur after two, after three, after four topics that are allowed in this language. The uh, systematic asymmetry is with the expression of left peripheral focus, uh, which is uh, typically limited to a single position. This is very easy to observe in uh, um, languages with overt focus markers because you, s you find the focus marker only once. So, for instance, uh, in 45, again, in uh, uh, a BG studied by uh, Clarisse uh, Hager and Bua, uh, in a thesis at the University of Geneva, um, we see that uh, the, we cannot have two uh, focus markers. Uh, uh, so, strictly limited to one, B being the focus marker in uh, the language. In languages uh, which do not have an overt focus marker, some more care is required to show the same thing uh, because one should tease apart proper focus from other things that are sometimes confused, like contrastive topic, for instance, which is sometimes improperly taken as a focal element. So once things are properly separated, it's quite clear that the generalization also holds. So the example that I've indicated in 46, um, somebody says, um, I know that this year Piero won the Olympics. Now I may disagree with two aspects of this statement. So maybe it was not Piero who won an important competition, but Gianni. And then maybe the competition was the World Championship and not the Olympics. Still, I cannot correct the two things in the same sentence with two 
corrective foci, something like 46b is uh, in fact uh, completely uh, excluded and the only possibility is to separate, uh, to have two sentences, each of which uh, has uh, exactly one uh, corrective focus in the left periphery. Here in the examples uh, from um, 47 uh, on, I have uh, uh, given uh, structures from various uh, languages uh, illustrating uh, this point, illustrating the uniqueness uh, uh, of uh, focus. Um, so in um, my 1997 uh, paper, I suggested an analysis of this asymmetry between topic and focus, uh, which capitalizes uh, on uh, uh, the uh, interpretive properties of these two notions. So the idea uh, was the following, and still is the following. Um, in 56, we have uh, the schema that corresponds to the interpretation of uh, focus presupposition structures. Um, so again, interpret my specifier as focus of the appropriate kind. Let's say, for instance, here, corrective focus and interpret my complement as presupposition, as the part on which I agree with my interlocutor. Okay? Then, if the focus uh, head was recursive, we would have representations like 57, for instance, with two occurrences of uh, focus, one embedded under the other. Uh, but then there would be an interpretive clash that would arise here, in the sense that the specifier of focus 2 in 57 should be interpreted as focal uh, because it's uh, the specifier of a focal head, but it should be part of the presupposition of focus 1, and this gives rise to a clash. Presumably something cannot be both things at the same time. So that for this uh, uh, interpretive reason, um, according to this analysis, uh, the multiplicity of left peripheral foci is excluded. Whereas nothing in the interpretation of topics precludes that possibility in due in part uh, to the very weakness of the notion of comment. More or less anything can be a comment. In particular, a comment can have a topic comment structure. So as far as the interpretation is concerned, nothing excludes uh, uh, the uh, proliferation uh, and the recursion of topics uh, in cases like uh, uh, 58, uh, uh, for instance. Um, uh, so this accounts uh, uh, systematically for the difference between the two cases. Now, um, as I also discussed in the mini course, um, we, have, we find principles and parameters here. So we find properties that remain constant and properties that are uh, variable. Um, for instance, uh, in uh, languages like Italian and other Romance languages, uh, the constraint on the uniqueness of uh, left peripheral focus is even stronger than what we have seen so far, because in case of a complex sentence like 67, uh, on page 7, um, we can have uh, a corrective focus in the main clause, 67a, in the embedded uh, clause, 67b, uh, uh, but not simultaneously in the main and in the embedded clause. So 67c uh, is not possible. So the um, solution that I proposed for this property in the 97 uh, paper uh, was that perhaps the same analysis that accounts for the uh, impossibility of two foci in, in simple clause extends to the complete case in the sense that uh, if the whole, C, the, the whole domain C commanded by the focus head is to be interpreted as presupposition, then this domain cannot contain another uh, focal uh, element. This solution turned out to be too strong because in many languages it is perfectly possible to have uh, uh, foci in uh, independent clauses of the same complex sentence. For instance, uh, 68, again in Gungbe, here we have the focus marker, so we cannot uh, make mistake, mistakes, and we have a focus 68a, both, or 68b, both in the main and in the embedded uh, uh, clause. 
So uh, this suggests that some parameter is involved here. Uh, one uh, uh, possibility would be to parameterize the way in which the presupposition is calculated. So it could be that uh, uh, you know the C domain of the focal head uh, is interpreted as uh, uh, focal only in a local way in a language like Goombe, so only within the same uh, simple uh, clause, whereas non-locally, the whole uh, C domain of the focal head functions as uh, uh, the presupposition in a language like Italian, as in 69, for instance. This is not, this is not a terribly plausible parameter, though. We would want, ideally, parameters to be related to very visible signals uh, available to the language learner who could determine which way uh, his or her language uh, goes. So a more uh, plausible approach here is to um, uh, capitalize on uh, the PF uh, interface, where an important difference between the two types of languages is found. So remember that uh, in uh, Italian, the uh, structures with uh, um, close initial uh, corrective focus have a representation like uh, 32 repeated here at the bottom of page uh, A with this high prominence followed by a flattening of the rest of the structure. So presumably one could uh, say that uh, in languages of this type, the impossibility of another focus simply follows from the flattening requirement because it, this would not be consistent uh, with another uh, prominence uh, in the uh, flattened uh, configuration. Whereas in uh, languages uh, like uh, uh, Gungbe, we do not have these properties at all, uh, as point 71, as Abo uh, points out, uh, there's no stress mechanism specific of focal structures. The only thing that is observed uh, is that uh, focus is marked uh, purely morphologically by the particle way in this language. Uh, and uh, um, in fact, as far as the contour is concerned, uh, no distinction is found between a topic and a focus structure. So this system, um, as uh, we uh, try to develop now, uh, involves, as in 72, a principle concerning logical form, which says that uh, the presupposition associated to focus necessarily includes the minimal clause C commanded by the focal head. So assume this to be generally valid uh, and something that will account for the fact that within uh, simple clauses uh, we can never have two focal specifications and a parameter concerning PF. So the language may use uh, or may not use uh, a special prosody for focus of the Italian uh, type. So by the interaction of this principle and parameter, we can uh, uh, capture the observed uh, uh, difference by having principles and parameters where they are expected. That is to say, a principle concerning the interface with uh, uh, logical form, where parameterization is less likely, and parameterization uh, involving uh, the interface uh, uh, with uh, uh, phonetic, phonology, phonetics, uh, where the evidence is abundant uh, for uh, parameter fixation. Okay, there are various uh, details that uh, uh, could be uh, further specified in this connection, but I will uh, now move uh, to a discussion of the freezing effects, uh, which have been on focus uh, in uh, uh, cartographic work on uh, the left periphery. So let's now move to page uh, 10, um, around the middle of the page, uh, criterial freezing. So criterial freezing is illustrated by examples like 48, A and B. So if we have an element satisfying a criterion, for instance, the question criterion, as in 40, 48A, sorry, the numbering is not uh, progressive here, so we go back to four. Uh, 48 on page 10. Um, well, from this configuration, it's not possible to further move the WH element. So something like 48B uh, cannot, is not a well-formed uh, structure. So this seems to justify a statement uh, 
like 49, which I called criterion freezing, that is to say an element which satisfies a criterion is frozen in the place where it satisfies uh, the uh, criterion. Now, do we need a statement of this sort or can we derive it from other considerations? Um, one could, for instance, for, for these simple examples, consider um, purely interpretive filters, right? One could say, well, after all, what is uh, the logical form that could be associated to an example like 48b? Uh, Somehow the WH element does not appear to be in uh, the position where it is needed to satisfy the selection of properties of a verb like wonder. So maybe the, the structure is simply ruled out by interpretive considerations. Uh, there is a kind of formal counterpart of this uh, uh, interpretive analysis, uh, uh, which is an analysis in terms of inactivation. This was proposed uh, by uh, Zeliko uh, Boscovich in uh, work in 2008, uh, where uh, Boscovich said, well, maybe what happens is that uh, in cases like 48a, the WH phrase, which book uh, checks the Q feature in the embedded complementizer, at that point it gets inactivated, so you cannot move further, following essentially uh, Chomsky's analysis of inactivation in uh, a uh, movement. Now, uh, these analyses work for simple cases, but they don't seem to be sufficient for more complex cases, which I've discussed in a number of papers. The more complex cases involve uh, phrases uh, which contain more than one criterial feature. Let's say a Q feature, for instance, and a focus feature, like how many books, uh, with books uh, correctively focalized. So take uh, a baseline sentence like uh, 50A, for instance. I don't know how many books they have published, not how many articles. Now here, how many books, uh, uh, sorry, how many art articoli, in, effect, in fact, quanti articoli, how many articles, um, contains two features, a Q feature and a focal uh, feature. So one could imagine that in this kind of situation, the phrase moves to one criterion position, satisfies one criterion, and then continues to move to another position, satisfies the other criterion. There will be no inactivation because there will be two features, so one would remain active. Also, from the viewpoint of the interpretation, it's not obvious that there would be a problem because uh, if we adopt the copy theory of traces as we should, the representation would be something like 52, in which the all the relevant information is expressed both in the embedded uh, complementizer system and in the main uh, complementizer system. Uh, uh, hence, the relevant information is present at the left. Nothing would, in principle, exclude the possibility of interpreting the Q element in the right position and the focal element in the right position in uh, the main uh, clause. But this never happens. So we need something uh, more refined than uh, that. Notice that it's not the case that the whole uh, phrase uh, satisfying a criterion is completely frozen because uh, if no other constraints are violated, it is possible to subextract from a phrase satisfying a criterion. Take for instance 53 here, starting from a phrase, complex phrase like how many books by this author, uh, we sub-extract by this author in uh, cleft, so in cases like 53, for instance, uh, and it is by this author that I don't know how many books have been published and so on and so forth. This is not very good in English, it's fine in Italian where there is a higher freedom in uh, the options of extraction from uh, uh, a DP. So this shows that uh, the freezing does not involve the whole uh, criterial phrase, but uh, only part of it. Um, in particular, what gets frozen is uh, uh, the uh, criterial goal, is the element that carries the criterial feature. So that element must remain in uh, the relevant criterial configuration so that uh, 
uh, a more adequate characterization of the freezing uh, principle, if you want, of the freezing effect, would be the one given in, uh, uh, on page 11 as 49 uh, prime. So in a criterial configuration, the criterial goal uh, is uh, frozen in place, so that if you have a complex phrase, the important thing is that the element with the relevant criterial feature remains there, but something can be subextracted, can be moved out, if other principles in the language are not violated. Okay, so the, the conclusion is that the criterial configuration cannot be undone uh, by moving the specifier to a higher position. What can be done is either move the whole criterial configuration, for instance, an indirect question can be topicalized, focalized, and so on, um, or uh, subextraction is possible if, again, other properties in the language are not violated. Okay, in uh, recent work, I've suggested that uh, maybe the um, freezing effects uh, that I've just illustrated uh, can be uh, derived uh, from uh, principles of uh, labeling interacting with other principles. So here I have uh, adopted uh, Chomsky's recent assumptions on labeling. You know, in uh, uh, if one adopts uh, um, X-bar theory, there's no problem, no, no labeling issue arises. Simply the structure receives uh, the label that is generated by the X-bar uh, schema. If one adopts uh, a merge-based system, then the issue arises. So you've got to, given the simple operation that merge is, take two things, put them together, you've got to have a way to assign a label to the entity that is created because you know, DPs and VPs and APs do not behave the same way. So we want to have names for these entities. Okay, so this, uh, um, well, uh, Chomsky's idea is that uh, uh, labeling uh, is, um, is a function of locality. Essentially, given a phrase created by merge, you look at the closest head to the node in question, and that head gives the label to the node. Uh, and then there is an assumption, as in 56, of complete labeling. So everything must be labeled when the structure is uh, transferred to the interfaces. I have expressed locality uh, in, uh, incorporated in the labeling uh, algorithm, as in 57, essentially incorporating relativized minimality into the definition. So 57, a node alpha created by merge receives the label uh, of uh, a head, H1, such that uh, alpha contains this head, and there is no other head, H2, such that uh, alpha contains this head, H2, and H2 C commands H1. So in simple words, uh, um, the, a node receives the label of the closest head, where closeness is determined by competition, essentially. A head is the closest to a given node if there is no other head that is even closer, uh, quite uh, obviously. Right? So this interacts in many ways with uh, uh, merge. We have in uh, 58, 59, and, and 60, the typology of merge can, uh, there's one kind of merge in which we take two elements from the lexicon and we put them together. That's how derivation start um, um, in uh, uh, a bottom-up system, of course. Then we have a head phrase merge, as in 59. So here we have a phrase that has already been formed. Then we take an element from the lexicon and we merge the element uh, with the phrase that was already stored in, uh, in some temporary storage space, some temporary workspace. So 59, that's the um, familiar uh, recursive uh, case of merge. And then we also need, as in 60, the possibility of merging two phrases, right? For instance, subject predicate, uh, the two phrases are formed independently in two separate workspaces, uh, and then we can merge them together. And this exhausts the cases of uh, merge. If merge is binary, there is nothing else. That, that's, that's all we have. Now, as far as labeling is concerned, uh, putting aside uh, 58 for the moment, 59 is not problematic because here H1 always wins 
the labeling competition, of course, where 60 is the problematic case, because uh, here uh, neither H1 nor H2 give rise to a minimality effect to the other case, because they don't see command each other, so they both qualify as possible labelers, but this is a situation that the system does not tolerate, so that labeling uh, is uh, blocked in this case. But then something must happen before the system gets to the interfaces. And there are two possible solutions for the labeling problem in, uh, a case, uh, uh, in cases like 60. Right? So we are now on page 12. Uh, one is movement. So we could take uh, phrase 1 and move it out. This would leave uh, phrase 2 and H2 as the only labeler uh, of the structure. This is inspired by work uh, uh, due to Andrea Moro uh, in a somewhat different context. Uh, and the, se the second possibility, here I'm sort of uh, putting together my own approach and Chomsky's approach, um, the uh, relevant case could be the creation of a, a criterial configuration, because uh, in a criterial configuration, both phrase one and phrase two share a crucial feature, which crucially is a categorial feature, as is uh, assumed in the um, criterial approach. So, for instance, um, when you internally merge a WH element, as in 63, and you merge which book with uh, did you read, both elements share the crucial feature, the Q uh, feature, so that uh, uh, this information can be uh, coherently provided uh, to, for, for the labeling of uh, the mother node, and alpha can be labeled as uh, Q, as a question, essentially, on the basis uh, of the criterion feature. So that's uh, how uh, topic phrases, focus phrases, relative phrases, uh, and so on, are formed in uh, this uh, system. Now, how does this uh, derive uh, uh, the uh, freezing properties? Uh, we need some more ingredients. So consider the, what, what has been called the halting problem for WH movement. So we have WH movement. Uh, we know that it proceeds stepwise for reasons of locality. Movement cannot jump across uh, large chunks of structure. It must move specifier uh, to uh, specifier, as uh, abundant cross-linguistic evidence uh, uh, suggests. But it so happens that it can stop in certain positions and not in other positions. So take, for instance, 65 and 66 and 12. Um, if uh, we have a complement uh, under a verb like think, um, a WH phrase moves through the complementizer system, but cannot stop there. So something like 65b is not possible. It must pass through that position, but it must continue to the main complementizer. Whereas in cases like 66, where the verb selects an indirect question, we have that, of course, the WH element can stop in the embedded complementizer, 66b, not only, but we also have the freezing effect, the fact that uh, further movement is not possible as we have uh, observed. So, how do we treat these properties in terms of labeling? The uh, relevant parts of the representations are 67 and 68. So, in 67, um, complement of verb like uh, think, which selects a declarative. Um, uh, here, the XP and the YP do not have anything relevant in common so they cannot label alpha, so the only possibility is further movement here, further movement of the WH element, so which books moves further, and alpha is correctly labeled uh, as uh, a declarative, essentially. That's uh, satisfying the selection of properties of thing. In 68, on the other hand, uh, Wonder selects an indirect question, so something headed by Q, then uh, we have a criterial configuration, uh, and uh, uh, here, uh, through the mechanism that I mentioned, uh, uh, the um, node can be labeled as Q. So we have an injured question. Then the structure is more complicated, of course, because uh, we have all the cartographic configuration, but uh, uh, we can just focus on this property.
Notice that this does not, uh, I mean, this accounts for the fact that WH movement can stop in this position, but not yet for the freezing effect. So why is it the case that it must stop? Well, here the proposal that I made is that um, um, there is a general fact that is generally acknowledged uh, but uh, uh, not explicitly stated, which is that phrasal movement is uh, limited to maximal phrases. So we have uh, DP movement, for instance, but not D bar movement stranding the specifier. We have uh, CP movement, uh, but not C bar movement, and so on and so forth. The examples in 69 are of AP movement uh, with the impossibility of A bar movement, as in 69. B, for instance, stranding the specifier. This is a very general fact for phrasal movement, uh, and a fact that, in my opinion, deserves to be stated, because you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important uh, element that determines how syntactic computations work. So I've stated it in 70, calling it maximality. So only maximal objects with a given label can be moved. Then we have head movement, different story. Maybe we can discuss that in the discussion uh, period. OK, so now if we adopt something like uh, bare phrase structure, uh, a maximal projection is not, I mean, you cannot just look at the quality of a node to determine if an element is a maximal projection or not, because there are no bar levels. So there must be a kind of dynamic definition of what is maximal, which says, uh, well, you have a given node alpha, you want to know if it is maximal, you look at the immediately dominating node, if it's also alpha, then the first alpha is not maximal. If it's different, let's say beta, then alpha is maximal. Okay, so it's very, very simple uh, algorithm. Now, uh, given this definition, then we have that when the criterial configuration is satisfied, as in 68, uh, the moved phrase, which book, ceases to be maximal once uh, uh, labeling has taken place, uh, ceases to be maximal with respect to the criterion feature. It will have some other features, but if we insist on a very rigid uh, application of the principle, which book will not be maximal for, uh, the, uh, with respect to the Q feature, hence it will be unmovable under uh, maximality. And this uh, can uh, derive uh, the effects uh, that uh, uh, we have uh, observed. So in, uh, in, in, uh, in a word, uh, uh, freezing in the complementizer system can be derived from uh, labeling and uh, uh, the maximality uh, principle. Now, I'd, I'd like to conclude, I don't know exactly, I don't remember when I started, so I don't know how much time I still have. I think I started a little bit late, so I'll take uh, a few more minutes. <laughs> I have more than uh, it looks like. Yes, OK. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I will not freeze. I will not freeze. I will, uh, I will continue to move. Um, OK. So um, yeah, what, what other uh, freezing effects do we uh, observe? Um, there, there are two effects that uh, I will briefly mention uh, here, and then uh, we, we can perhaps uh, uh, discuss their properties in the discussion period. Um, one is freezing in subject position. Um, so um, if we think in terms of uh, halting position and transiting positions, uh, and we try to extend this uh, to A chains, clearly the subject position, or at least a particular kind of subject position, is a typical halting position, a typical stopping position. Right? At some point, movement must stop, otherwise we just continue to move things uh, for the rest of our life, and we would produce not even a single sentence, in fact, because movement just goes on. Um, so th that's not what happens. Uh, and uh, uh, subject is a halting position. Um, and uh, um, so uh, this leads us to the assumption that maybe there is something like a subject criterion. I mean, what would be the interpretive property? I mean, criteria typically go with scope discourse type properties. 
So what kind of interpretive property could be associated to subject positions? Um, one uh, uh, possibility uh, is that uh, uh, you know, the, the subject somehow is the argument that is selected uh, to the effect that the event is presented as being about that argument. Right? So that differentiates, for instance, between active and passive uh, pairs. In active, uh, the event is presented as being about uh, the agent. In passive, it's presented as being about uh, the uh, patient. Uh, and uh, uh, this uh, aboutness property, which looks somewhat elusive, still has consequences for discourse organization, for an after resolution, for instance, in the following way. Let's take cases uh, in which an active and a passive sentence are presented in a what happened type context. So you hear a noise, you don't know anything about uh, uh, the participants in the event, but you just know that something happened. Then you can uh, ask a question like 71, uh, what happened uh, simply. Then you may answer with either an active or a pa somebody else may answer with either an active or a passive structure, a 72 A and B. So, for instance, I'm using Italian for a reason that will be immediately uh, visible. 72A, un ragazzo ha buttato a terra un vecchio, active sentence, uh, or the corresponding passive, 72B, un vecchio è stato buttato a terra da un ragazzo. Here there's no informational properties, everything is uh, new information, right? The, the reference have not been introduced, the event is new. Still I can choose the aboutness property here one way or the other. Now, years ago, Andrea Calabrese observed that uh, in null subject languages, in full uh, null subject languages, when uh, uh, these structures are produced, and in the immediately following sentence, uh, there is a null subject, a small pro subject, uh, as in 73, then it always picks out uh, the um, subject of predication, the aboutness subject of the previous sentence. So if something like 73, an immediately null subject, uh, started uh, uh, shouting uh, after 72A, it's the boy who started shouting. After 72B, it's the old man who started uh, shouting. So there is this clear effect, the Calabrese effect allows us to detect uh, the aboutness property in contexts of the kind that I've just illustrated. So um, if it is plausible to assume a subject criterion, um, we can implement things in the way indicated in 74. So on the one hand, we need the structural ingredient. So we postulate a subject uh, uh, head, 74A, following here Cardinaletti, uh, an obligatory head in the clausal spine, much as T, let's say, much as aspect, and so on and so forth. And the obligatoriness of subj is our way of expressing what in the GB uh, system was called the EPP, the Extended Projection Principle. It's the requirement that subject positions are obligatory. Then in syntax, this head will attract movement of uh, nominal uh, expression to the specifier, so the subject will end up in that uh, position. At the, at the interface, uh, this head will trigger the aboutness uh, interpretation with such effects as the Calabrese effect. Then, as, as is always a good uh, norm, uh, a good uh, guideline in cartographic work, we look at uh, other languages to see if there is a plausible candidate for an overt morphological realization of the subject head. And a plausible candidate uh, is uh, the subject lytic of the northern Italian dialects, as in 75, for instance, right? There's this subject lytic which conveniently, obligatorily occurs in uh, many dialects uh, in between the subject DP and uh, the predicate, starting with the inflected verb. So it's a natural, I mean, there's, one can make the natural hypothesis uh, that this is an overt morphological realization of the subject head. Once we have a subject criterion, we expect freezing effects. And do we find freezing effects? Well, it is well known uh, 
that all other things being equal, subjects are harder to move than objects. Not impossible to move, but harder to move than objects. For instance, there are such things as that trace effects that concern subjects, but not objects. Example um, 76, for instance, who do you think that will come? Believe it or not, if you're not uh, a speaker of uh, English, is uh, not well formed. Uh, and uh, um, whereas there's no such constraint for object movement as in 76b. Uh, uh, and similarly in many other languages, not all languages in fact, some languages do not have the effect as is well known. Um, so uh, that trace effects can be analyzed uh, through uh, freezing uh, because one intermediate step in the derivation of 76a would be 78 with the who transiting in uh, the specifier position of the subject head. But then we know that this is not a transitive position because we have the subject criterion so that we have the freezing effect here and who cannot continue its uh, journey. And that uh, accounts for the that trace uh, effect. Um, of course, languages use strategies uh, for making subjects movable, English uses the strategy of reducing the structure, so dropping the complementizer system and also, according to this analysis, dropping the subject uh, uh, layer, right? So that uh, who do you think will come is possible, as in 79, uh, because, well, simply the freezing position is not there. It's very clear that some languages use a structural reduction strategy, for instance, Languages with so-called uh, anti-agreement, uh, like Berber, for instance, uh, um, when there are subject questions, so quite simply, part of the in, uh, the higher part of an inflectional structure is not in the sentence, it's truncated. Right? So English uses a variant, a somewhat less radical variant uh, of uh, this uh, uh, strategy. Other languages use other strategies. Um, for instance, my very old um, analysis. Uh, of uh, uh, the fact that uh, typically in null subject languages, both full null subject languages and partial null subject languages, we do not have that trace effects, uh, follows uh, from the availability of small pro, of expletive small pro, which can formally satisfy the subject criterion, as in uh, 80, uh, so chi credi che verrà is just uh, fine in uh, Italian. So the idea here is that small pro satisfies the subject criterion and makes it possible to extract the thematic subject from a lower and non-criterial position. So in this sense, um, um, the uh, criterial approach uh, uh, offers a comprehensive alternative to the classical ECP analysis of these effects, uh, right? So it's uh, uh, ECP effects uh, have kind of been uh, neglected uh, and put aside under minimalism given that the ECP, uh, given the fact that the ECP did not have a precise status in terms of the typology of possible principles in uh, uh, minimalism, uh, but I think it is possible to rethink the whole class of ECP effects uh, as uh, uh, following from freezing, hence ultimately labeling and uh, uh, maximality. Uh, and other languages use, use other strategies, so either truncation or certain expletives that can be used to allow the subject to move uh, um, without violating uh, freezing effects, or by adding structures, like in the Kuki rule of French. Some languages use the radical strategy of pipe piping the whole embedded clause. So for instance, in uh, certain varieties of Quechua, uh, who do you think will come, comes out uh, something like, uh, who, will, who will come do you think? So essentially the whole embedded clause is pipe piped uh, to the uh, main clause specifier. Okay, so this is for subject positions. And if I have another three minutes, three, three minutes, five, five minutes, let's say five. Let's say five. Um, so um, freezing effects in the complementizer system, freezing effects in uh, uh, 
uh, the, the high IEP structure with uh, freezing effects in subject position, then do we have other freezing effects? Yes, of course. I will just mention one other such effect in uh, a low criterial position, in the low periphery of the uh, verb phrase. Now, here I'm following uh, Adriana Belletti's analysis, according to which uh, there is uh, a low uh, focus position in uh, the periphery of the VP or of the small uh, VP, or the predicate anyway, um, uh, which, among other things, uh, is the position used in subject inversion sentences. You can show, well, in Italian you have both SV and VS sentences, and in VS sentences, uh, Belletti shows uh, that the subject is necessarily focal because uh, using certain tests uh, for focal character, turns out that it is focal. For instance, uh, as in 82 on page 15, uh, if we, take, uh, we can take backward anaphora as a diagnostic for distinguishing focal and non-focal position. Focal positions do not easily enter into backward anaphora, as uh, Chomsky pointed out many years ago in the context of a discussion of the uh, weak crossover. Uh, so, 82A, uh, alla sua festa Gianni ha cantato, here you have a preverbal subject, and backward anaphora, with respect to sua is possible, but with postverbal subjects, as 82B, alla sua festa ha cantato Gianni, it must be somebody else's uh, uh, party, not uh, Gianni's. And then Belletti concludes, this is a focal position. Now, does this focal position determine freezing effects? Um, in normal cases, this low focus position can be taken or not. So, in, in a certain sense, it's optional. If it is optional, then it's not easy to see the freezing effect because we'd always not take it. But there are certain constructions, there's one construction in particular, in which it is necessary to take that uh, low uh, focal position. This is in so-called uh, inverse copular constructions, according to Andrea Moro's uh, terminology, or specificational sentences in uh, Higgins, uh, Roger Higgins' terminology. So, copular structures, as in 83, 84, uh, can be direct or inverse in Moro's terminology. Gianni è il direttore, il direttore è Gianni, both are uh, fine. Now, it has been uh, noticed that uh, in inverse copular constructions, in which the referential DP is post-copular, and uh, the other, let's say, predicative DP is pre-copular, as 84, the post-copular DP is necessarily focal. This can be shown, for instance, through Belletti's uh, test, 85A, direct copular construction, uh, backward anaphora is possible, 85B, uh, uh, inverse copular construction, uh, inverse, uh, um, I mean, uh, backward anaphora becomes uh, impossible. It, this must be somebody else's uh, class, not uh, Gianni's uh, class, in, uh, uh, when a sentence like 85b is uttered. This property has been observed in many languages. For instance, uh, Caroline Haycock uh, proposed a detailed analysis, cross-linguistic analysis of this effect, holds in English, for instance, you can create many contexts that show this effect. So, Haycock says, says uh, I'll take 88, A uh, uh, and B, um, um, in 88 prime, A and B, um, in the direct copular construction, both the first DP and the second DP can be focal, right? So, who is the culprit, John or Bill? John is the culprit. Focal, focus on John. 88 uh, prime, tell me about John. Is he the culprit or the victim? 88 prime B, John is the culprit. Focus on the second DP. But in the inverse construction, that's not possible. So 90 A is fine with the culprit, John on, or Bill. The culprit is John, that's fine. But 90 prime uh, A, tell me about John. Is he the culprit or the victim? You cannot use the inverse construction to uh, answer here. So, necessary focus uh, here. Why is it so? Well, in a uh, uh, recent uh, paper, I've suggested that 
this may have to do with locality. Maybe the focalization of the subject uh, is a consequence of the fact that uh, otherwise locality would be violated in the generation of the inverse copular construction. Why is it so? Assuming a basic structure like 91, uh, which I assume to be common to direct and inverse copular constructions with some kind of predic predicative nucleus, the direct copular construction is derived by movement as in the arrow without any problem, but the inverse copular constructions in 92 would move the lower nominal across the higher, no higher nominal, and this would violate locality, violate, again, relativized minimality or whatever principle of locality you want to adopt. So the idea here is that focalization of the subject is a way to solve the locality problem in the following sense. 93a, you first get the subject, uh, the referential subject, out of the picture by focalizing it. 93b, there is one of these reorderings that we know to be possible in, uh, within the IP, what, for instance, uh, Collins uh, calls smuggling in the case of passive, but there are many other such kinds uh, of reordering, so you have movement, uh, of the remnant of the small clause uh, across the focal position without violating anything. Then at this point, uh, the second DP, il direttore, the director, can be moved to subject position, as in 93C, without uh, violating uh, locality. So according to this idea, which I've only been able to sketch out in very, very roughly uh, here, um, the focal character uh, of uh, uh, the uh, second DP uh, is a consequence uh, uh, of, uh, is a way of to solve a locality problem. Now, whether this analysis is uh, on the right track or not, the fact remains uh, that this position is focal. So in this construction, it is, uh, uh, it's a way to uh, be sure that we are activating Belletti's low focus position. Then we can test freezing effects, and in fact this has already been tested already a long time ago in the 80s by Giuseppe Longobardi, who pointed out that in the inverse copular construction it's not possible to move the second uh, DP uh, at all. For instance, uh, we could uh, cleft the uh, referential DP uh, in the direct construction, as in 98A, a Gianni che è il direttore, that's fine, but uh, uh, 98b, in which we try to cleft uh, uh, the, uh, deep, the lower dp in the inverse copular construction, is completely uh, impossible. And similarly for the other uh, cases of, of movement, uh, as uh, uh, Longobardi uh, observed and as Moro uh, subsequently uh, discussed. Okay? So we have. Uh, um, this kind of freezing effects, both uh, in the very high part of the structure, left periphery, in uh, the high part of the IP subject positions, and in lower parts of the um, IP structure, in fact, at the point of contact with the predicate, as in Belletti's uh, uh, low uh, focus position. Okay, so uh, let, let me just say one sentence uh, concerning the appendix and then I will have uh, uh, concluded this presentation. Uh, I, I think this maximality principle, uh, which was somehow always assumed but uh, never explicitly stated, uh, is, uh, uh, has the potential of uh, being a significant principle on the functioning of syntax. Uh, for instance, uh, a number of left branch effects could be related to maximality. It has the flavor of uh, the A over A principle, the very first locality principle proposed by Chomsky in uh, the beginning of the 60s, and that triggered uh, Ross's dissertation as a response, and which remains true by and large in a number of cases, uh, has the flavor of maximality. Um, can be used. Uh, for instance, have used it uh, 
to account for the ban against excorporation. So if through head movement you create a complex uh, head, then you cannot take one piece of that complex head and move it out. That's the ban against excorporation. And that seems to me to be amenable also to the maximality idea. Now, a um, couple of years ago, uh, Epstein, Seeley, and Kidahara pointed out um, uh, that uh, uh, there, there is a conceptual problem uh, connected to this principle of maximality uh, in the sense that it seems to be conflicting with the view that uh, movement is just a particular case of merge. Because if this is so, uh, they say, it would not be expected that certain uh, sub-instances of merge would uh, respect the principle of this sort, whereas other instances would not. Right? So there, there is some kind of conceptual problem there. I think a local response um, to this objection can be that uh, in any event movement cannot be fully reduced uh, to uh, merge because it involves at least the steps indicated in 101 uh, prime, second and third on page 17, that is to say um, there is first a search operation, right, uh, connecting a head, uh, a probe uh, to a goal. Then there is uh, uh, 101, 2, the identification of a phrase that contains uh, the goal, right? What is moved is not just the goal, it's a larger phrase that contains the goal. So there must be an operation that identifies such a larger phrase. This is the operation that is involved in so-called pipe piping, essentially. And then the third operation is the merger of this entity thus identified with the whole uh, structure, right? So minimally, one could uh, respond to the Epstein et al. critique by saying that maximality constrains point uh, two, that is to say, the identification of the phrase that can undergo, of the candidate uh, that can undergo merge and not merge itself. In that sense, uh, there's no uh, conceptual problem with respect to the idea that movement involves pure and simple uh, merge. But perhaps there is even a more uh, interesting um, response that can be given, which I will not be able to develop, in part because uh, uh, my time now is finished, and in part because I do not have a complete answer, or not even the beginning, <laughs> maybe I have just the beginning of an answer, which is that um, in fact, if you think of how uh, a minimalist derivation works, um, particularly external merge, but also internal merge, um, there is this uh, no tampering condition uh, or extension condition. Right? Now, if you think of it, uh, it is a kind of a maximality principle. It's a principle that says when you have created a structure, you cannot apply merge to a subpart of that structure. You must take the structure as a whole. So that in a sense, these conditions can be seen uh, as uh, maximality principles. So this is, uh, I think, promising enough uh, to uh, lead us uh, to explore the possibility that a single maximality principle or a family of maximality principles uh, may be uh, a topic that uh, is worth uh, developing in uh, the uh, years to come. And I will conclude on this now. Thank you. Thank you, Luigi. Uh, now we have some minutes, uh, more or less 30 minutes, uh, okay, uh, for questions. There is a trend in cartographic works to follow Keynes' one feature, one head principle, at least as a departing point, a methodological departing point, uh, as uh, you've already mentioned in your co authored paper with Cinque, 2010, in Narog's handbook. If one assumes Rizzi and uh, Bocci's uh, 2016, given as example two in the handout, there's only one position in the left periphery, 
dedicated for focus. So the folk head would attract to its specifier the constituent uh, which gets focused. You've mentioned uh, in the mini course, as well as at the very beginning of uh, this conference, the existence of a more fine-grained typology for focus. And you also mentioned the mirative focus, for instance. So, two questions come to mind. First, should one expect that each different type of focus would project a functional projection on its own? So, should one follow the idea that mirative focus would have a different position from, for instance, corrective focus? Or should uh, uh, we assume a unique position for focus, the other features being checked in the course of the derivation? So, for instance, in case of mirative focus, uh, the mirative focus would first move to spec mirative within the inflectional domain to check those relevant features and then move to spec folk in the left periphery? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, so uh, you mentioned several points. One is the guideline, uh, one uh, feature, one head, like, which is, I think, a very productive guideline and which I think represents some progress with respect to the assumption that any arbitrary assembly of feature can form a lexical item. Right? This is a, an assumption that is often made, but it seems to me that it uh, uh, insufficiently constrained. I mean, it would uh, lead us to expect all sorts of monsters that we do not actually uh, find. So the idea, uh, one feature, one head, is important. Perhaps it, it cannot be um, kept uh, uh, as, a con as a completely systematic assumption because uh, uh, we need a typology of features. So there are certain features that characterize the category, then there must be some other features that, for instance, trigger intermediate movement. I'm assuming, contrary to other people in uh, current discussions, that also intermediate movement uh, is triggered by features uh, and that uh, we have certain traces uh, of such cases uh, in uh, languages, for instance, in which uh, embedded complementizers agree with the WH element when it moves uh, to the main complementizer. So there are languages in which things like, uh, who do you think that uh, Bill saw, uh, the, that uh, in the embedded clause agrees in some form with the WH element, right? So this is a very straightforward kind of evidence that movement took place through that position. Moreover, that it left, left some kind of trace that is morphologically visible. So what I'm assuming here is that there are uh, here I'm adopting the distinction between interpretable and uninterpretable features. So there are, uh, there are criterial features that are interpretable, of course, because they, they express the fact that a certain configuration is a question, a relative, and so on. Uh, and they have purely formal counterparts that trigger movement to intermediate positions. And these other features may uh, be morphologically manifested, like in languages uh, uh, which, which have the property that I just mentioned. Um, and then, in this case, presumably these features may be glued, which will disappear, will be checked, may be glued to other elements, right? So only certain, let's say, important features define in a unique, uh, in a unique way uh, ahead. I've developed this idea a little bit uh, in a, a recent paper that was published in the last issue um, of uh, um, linguistic analysis. Uh, there is a very interesting issue of the journal, very rich issue of the journal that is dedicated to current views of parameterization with papers also by Chomsky and uh, by, by Guglielmo Cinque and myself, Longobardi and uh, uh, many uh, others where I have developed this uh, idea a little bit. Now in connection specifically with focus, uh, it's clear that uh, uh, it, it, it makes sense to think uh, of the possibility of compounding certain features, right? We, we, for instance, 
take, take the fact uh, that is often discussed in connection with uh, uh, violations of weak islands. Yesterday, I discussed the effect of the lexical restriction. There is another effect uh, which is similar uh, of the notion of delinking, discourse linking, right? So discourse linked WH elements uh, are more easily extractable from weak islands and bare non-discourse linked uh, WH elements. So a discourse linked WH element already suggests that there are two features presumably there, right? Discourse linked, which may be quasi-topical, I don't know if that, that's correct, but somehow related to topicality and uh, Q, right? So clearly two features are involved, and then what you said about mirative focus uh, uh, may be uh, along, along similar lines, uh, etc. There would be two possible implementations. One is what you suggested. So you move to one feature, and, and then uh, you, uh, the, the element acquires this feature and then moves to another feature. Now, this is not completely congenial with the freezing view, right? Because if you phrase freezing in a very strict manner, you'd have freezing in the first position, right, already. So maybe it's possible to modify the freezing idea in a way to be consistent with this. But another possibility, which I think uh, is promising, at least in certain cases, is that you create featural conglomerates uh, through head movement. So suppose that, that you have one feature that is Q, let's say, and one feature that is uh, connected to delinking, then maybe you can form through head movement a complex head, and then this complex head will attract something that is at the same time Q and uh, delinked. And the same may be true for the other case uh, that, uh, that you mentioned. So I would um, um, favor this way of looking at things. It's also possible, I think, to pursue the line you suggested, but that would require some revision of the way in which I've stated uh, the freezing effects. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. So. It's a clarification question concerning the inverse copular constructions. Uh, what kind of criteria is involved in the attraction of the small clause? Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. okay, yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, no, it's an important question. So, um, if all movement terminates in a kind of criterial position, right, I mean, there should be something <laughs> to, to be said there. Um, I would not want to commit myself to a very specific analysis. Uh, I'm just assuming that these reorderings um, within uh, the lower part of uh, uh, the IP are possible, uh, and instances of that uh, are uh, um, Collins' analysis of passive, in which there is a predicative chunk that moves uh, to some functional position, thus liberating somehow, thus allowing the direct object to move to subject position without violating locality, because you, you still have the external argument somewhere. I am assuming such properties for certain reorderings that Cinque talks about. Remember that Cinque, in his discussion of the ordering of adverbials, observes that in some cases, uh, there are some surprising possibilities of having two adverbs in uh, the wrong order, given uh, uh, his, his expectations. And then he plausibly analyzes these cases uh, as involving not a movement of the adverbial over the other, but of some kind of VP chunk uh, in a way of stranding uh, an adverbial, so that an adverbial that normally would be higher would turn out to follow a lower adverbial, but simply because we have moved uh, a larger piece. I think the analysis of psych verbs requires that sort of thing, particularly situations in which psych verbs, like please in Italian, allows for the selection of two subjects. You can either start with the experiencer, and you have a quirky subject, something like to John please, uh, the, please us the music, or 
the other option that is to say the music pleases to John, that would be in a, in a language like Italian. So in this case too, I think that this double possibility is a consequence of the possibility of moving a chunk, which allows the lower argument to jump across the higher argument. And then the other big case for these movements, which is very straightforward, is the causative construction. The causative construction in many Romance, uh, not, not just Romance languages, uh, African languages, and so on and so forth, in which you see that uh, a, a predicative chunk moves across the subject, essentially, and then the, so you, you have something like, uh, uh, I will make uh, wash the car to John, meaning I will make John wash the car, essentially, so wash the car moves uh, over the subject, and then the object again can undergo passivization and, and become. So I, I am assuming that this class of movements exist, and then uh, the next question is, uh, yeah, you're right. So there, there should be some reason for that uh, kind of movement. So I can assume some kind of feature attraction, but it would be important to develop uh, the analysis here to have a more precise uh, uh, motivation for this kind of movement. I just start from acknowledging that these movements must exist and capitalize on them for my analysis. Yeah, um, I'm sort of wondering about the multiple foci. And uh, because, I mean, there, I mean, if you look at German or English, I mean, there's certainly constructions with multiple foci. And I mean, just um, so look at um, contrastive answers to multiple questions. So you have who went where, like John went to the Maldivas and Mary went to the Azores. And so you have two foci. And um, what at least I mean German and English do in this case is um, they break this down into um, a set of questions. And like, where did John go? Where did Mary go? And um, then in this case, um, the people, they get um, singled out and treated as contrastive topics with a special intonation. And so then, of course, you can play this, can continue to play this game. And so you have like triple foci, where did, um, um, who, mm -hmm. went, uh, where, when, etc. And then again, I mean, you sort of see that um, you, this then gets treated as sets of sets of questions, where in each case, one element some call it the sorting key gets uh, singled out. And I'm sort of wondering what happens in Italian in this case. I mean, is it just that this one focus position that you have is like if you have a, just a double question, um, it, uh, it's basically a contrastive topic mm -hmm. or, um, uh, well. but then you should sort of, uh, I don't know whether you hear that in the intonation. Right. And, yeah, right. and so it couldn't be an LF principle in a way, barring multiple foresight. But there's something very interesting going on in always like breaking down a multiple breaking questions down, yeah. into a set of questions or a set of sets of questions where in every step you sort of single out one element and give it a special syntactic status if you can, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Yeah, this this is an important question. Um, um, so the, let, let me start with the factual part of the answer. So how does it work in Italian? Um, many years ago, um, I think one, one of the first uh, uh, talks of linguistics that uh, I heard was given by Barbara Parti in uh, Pisa, right, in the 70s. And then Barbara was discussing multiple questions in English. And everybody in the audience was puzzled, said, what's that? I mean, what? Why, do, why should people ask these kind of things, right? Uh, and, and that was also my reaction, my reaction. So, and in fact, up to 1982, in, in my book, uh, Issues on Italian Syntax, I state that multiple questions are not possible in Italian, <laughs> right? And, and Andrea Calabrese, um, in, in fact, uh, develops uh, an analysis of that that relates again to the uniqueness of focus and so on and so forth. Now I have the feeling that the language is changing under my eyes, <laughs> right? So that you hear, you hear multiple questions uh, and uh, uh, so presumably whatever parametric properties involved, because then for instance um, 
I asked my uh, student and friend, Enoch Habo, uh, about multiple questions in Gungwe. He said, no, no, no way. You cannot, you cannot have uh, that. Uh, it's completely impossible. So it, it looks as if uh, in order to get multiple questions, you must some, I mean, there must be one, I mean, they're not given for free in a certain sense. There must be some element in the language that, that makes it possible to have such, uh, such configuration. And maybe this element is now entering into Italian. The analysis that you suggest in terms of uh, uh, sets of answers involving the identification of one contrastive topic and then focus uh, is, uh, I think, the, 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 what, what seems to be the promising analysis for that uh, kind of thing. I could add that uh, uh, immediately before this conference, I was in Korea in another workshop, and uh, there was a very interesting paper on Hungarian which provided, uh, in fact, clear intonational evidence. Uh, in, in that language, uh, contrastive topics are very clearly distinct intonationally from proper foci. And then she showed that the typical answer to multiple questions involves uh, uh, exactly the, the kind of configuration that you mentioned, that a contrastive topic followed by a focus and, and so on and so forth. So, um, okay, that uh, complex answer which doesn't maybe get <laughs> to, to the, uh, the, the exact point that you wanted to make, but uh, I, what, what I can say is that there is something special about multiple questions, uh, as the cross-linguistic variation seems to suggest, and maybe this something special is the possibility of uh, uh, somehow uh, attributing the configuration that, that you described. I mean, this configuration in which one of the elements is, uh, in fact, the, the, the value of one of the variables is taken as a contrastive topic, and then the value of the other value is, uh, is taken as, uh, as focus. I, I thought it was an interesting story just to, both uh, personal and, uh, and also uh, the history of the language is interesting because this very clearly, there is a very, very clearly a development uh, there that is uh, now taking place. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank Luigi. You. Thank you very much.